Best-selling author and human rights advocate Kati Martin has served as the chair of the International Women's Health Coalition, chief advocate for the UN's Office of the Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict, and board member of the Human Rights Watch. She is currently a director of the Committee to Protect Journalists and board member of the International Rescue Committee, the New America Foundation, and the Central European University. She is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Penn International, and the Authors Guild. A contributor to major networks and news publications worldwide, Kati has also published nine books, including Enemies of the People, My, Father, My Family's Journey to America, a 2010 finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Prize, Paris, A Love Story, a New York Times bestseller, and True Believers, Stalin's Last American Spy. Among countless honors for writing and human rights advocacy, Martin has received the Commander's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Hungary. She was also recognized by the United Nations and named a Rockefeller Foundation Creative Arts Fellow. Kati will share insights about Richard Holbrook and this award and Dayton's role in international affairs. Kati Martin. Good evening. It's always deeply moving, for, particularly for whatever reason this year, but it's always moving for me to be back here with you in Dayton. And let me just add to all the wonderful things, the tributes that, uh, that have been given to Sharon, who has really created well, more than a literary prize, she's created a community. And if, if we need any proof that, uh, that a single determined human can, can make an enormous difference, um, look no further than Sharon. <laughs> my, my husband, Richard Holbrook, chose Dayton not Paris or Vienna, perhaps more glittering backdrops for international diplomacy. He chose Dayton very deliberately because he wanted to demonstrate to the world that America was not only a great war power, America was also about muscular diplomacy. Diplomacy was America's business and Dayton, in America's heartland, is now forever intertwined with peace and with Richard's memory. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for that. It was the greatest privilege of my life to have spent those days here behind the high wire of Wright-Patterson Air Base and to observe Richard's high-wire diplomacy. At the opening dinner in the cavernous Wright-Patterson hangar, Richard assigned me my first diplomatic mission. He said, Kati, make those two war criminals, future war criminals, they would be tried as, uh, who just a week before were, were uh, waging war against each other, make them talk to each other. He seated me between, between uh, Slobodan Milosevic and Ali Izbegovic. And, um, well, I nearly failed. <laughs> but in the end, I did make them talk to each other. Do not believe those who say that nothing can be done to stop so-called ancient ethnic hostilities, be it in the Balkans or in Syria or Iraq. With all-in diplomacy and dogged determination, Richard proved those cynics wrong. His diplomacy was not a zero-sum, winner-take-all poker game. Humiliation never persuades anyone. The, its triumph is brief. The Dayton Peace Accords have held for 24 years. Without American diplomacy, 
that war would have continued and thousands more young lives would be lost. There are Bosnian refugees here with us tonight in this beautiful hall who would not have had a second chance at life. But America has to stay engaged in the Balkans and elsewhere to assure that the guns stay silent. Now, diplomacy, Richard's sort, is itself under fire. How proud Richard would be of his colleagues who defy orders not to speak truth to power, and at great risk to their careers, honor their pledge to serve the Constitution. Let me, let me name a few of them. I'm speaking of Ambassadors William Taylor and Ambassador Marie Jovanovic and Colonel Alexander Vindman. A purple, Colonel Vindman, a purple heart decorated officer smeared by some as a spy. The Colonel's crime is that he was a refugee from Ukraine who rose to be the National Security Council's ranking Ukrainian specialist, a true American success story. <laughs> did, we not, did we not all come from some place to become Americans? Isn't that the whole idea of America? If, if those who have never fought on our behalf have never even heard a shot fired in anger, question the patriotism of actual American heroes for the crime of not being born here, what will be left of our country that's worth saving? Is this not the moment for citizens to break their silence? Each year when I come to visit you, Dayton reminds me of why my parents brought me to this strange land as a small child who spoke no English. We were refugees. My mother and father brought no wealth with them, just a suitcase full of photo albums, and the hope that their children would be spared the hate that they faced, first from the Nazis who killed my grandparents, and then the Soviets, who separated my sister and me from our parents for nearly two years when they jailed them. My parents were officially deemed enemies of the people for the crime of being good journalists. That is a label that we hear often these days, and not only from the mouth of foreign dictators. Hate spreads fast, much faster than love. I saw that in the faces of those who came to arrest my parents. And I saw it among the Balkan hate mongers who turned neighbors into murderous enemies. Sadly, I saw it again on the face of the gunman who shot and killed nine innocent people here in Dayton in August. My heart ached for all of you, for all of us, that we now live in a land deemed by some other countries as dangerous as a result of indiscriminate hatred. Countries from Japan to Venezuela, Venezuela, now issue travel warnings to those planning a trip here. That is not our America. In Scott Momaday, member of the Kiowa tribe and a winner of the National Medal of Arts, Dayton has chosen a remarkable humanitarian and artist as the Holbrook Prize recipient. As I read Scott's words that, quote, I simply kept my goal in mind and persisted, I thought, how absolutely fitting, as in the arts, so in diplomacy, persistence against great odds and against naysayers, which is what drove Richard to end that bloody war in the Balkans, when others said that the Balkans were a far off place and not our responsibility. But ours is a very small planet 
and we share it with people who may not look or sound like us, but who really are us in different clothes and with perhaps less good fortune. Scott Momade has also said, and I quote, that in the beginning was the word and it was spoken. These days we often use words to distance and to wound and to humiliate the other. Tonight we honor those who use words as a way into each human heart. Let us use this award this evening, this town, this town of peace, where a war of hate was stopped to turn the written and the spoken word into a bridge to reach each other, to hear each other. In the beginning was the word, our Holbrook Prize winner has said, and it was neither shouted nor tweeted, it was spoken. Thank you very much. Jill Scott Mamaday is an actor, a writer, and a prolific filmmaker. Her film, Return to Rainy Mountain, documents her Kiowa heritage and life in the arts as daughter of Pulitzer Prize winning author N. Scott Mamaday. It is my pleasure to introduce Jill Mamaday, who will introduce the recipient of the Richard C. Holbrook Distinguished Achievement Award for 2019, her father, N. Scott Mamaday. Jill? Good evening. It is so wonderful for us to be here in this incredible community of people. These last days for, for my father and for me have been really extraordinary. And I'm shaking. I'm shaking this evening from the words that were spoken tonight and being in the presence of so many extraordinary people with such heart and such fierceness. So thank you for, for so warmly welcoming us here this evening. Sharon, wow. I want to thank you especially because when you called me and asked me to come, I I've been going through a lot of personal stuff in my life and I didn't know if I could do it. Um, I'm not an academic, not like my dad and, and so many of you incredible people in the audience, but I'm a storyteller. And so what I wanted to do this evening to talk a little bit about my dad was to tell a little bit of his, his story, our story, the story that comes from my Kiowa people because we are storytellers from the oral tradition. My dad, Navar Scott Mamaday, was born in 1934 at the Kiowa Comanche Indian Hospital in Lawton, Oklahoma. His father, Alfred Morris Mamaday, was born in a teepee in the year 1913 on the allotment of land as his own father built the homestead. Alfred's first language was Kiowa. My dad's mother, Natachi Scott, a writer, was a mixed blood beauty of Cherokee, Choctaw, French and English descent. From a very young age, my father was told the mythic stories of the Kiowa oral tradition from his dad. His mother read to him the poems and literature that she loved. These are the things that began to shape the man. His parents were teachers and got jobs through the BIA on various Indian reservations in the Southwest. My dad was exposed to language, Navajo, Apache, and then Towa at Jemez Pueblo. 
And even though English was spoken at home, my dad's ear was filled with native language and words. The culture and landscapes touched his soul. He was deeply aware of his native being and where he came from. By the time he entered Stanford University, he was already mastering the English language and the rich song, ceremony, and spirit of his native heritage gave voice to his first poems. His mentor, Ivor Winters, head of the creative writing and poetry program at Stanford, saw great promise in the young Mama Day. He prophesied that his path would lead to greatness. These are the things that shaped the man made of words. And now in his 85th year, he is on fire. His imagination is unstoppable. I come to his house most days and he is writing, composing poetry and story, painting and drawing at his easel. In this year alone, he has completed two manuscripts that are at press and is finishing the third. I'd like to paraphrase just a little bit on the back cover of his latest book called The Death of Sitting Bear, due out in 2020, published by HarperCollins. Considered one of the most important voices in American letters, distinguished poet, novelist, artist, teacher, and storyteller, N. Scott Mamaday, born into the Kiowa tribe, grew up on Indian reservations in the Southwest. This luminous collection demonstrates Mamaday's mastery and love of language and matters closest to his heart. To Mamaday, words are sacred, language is power. Spanning nearly 50 years, the poems gathered here illuminate the human condition, Mamaday's connection to his Kiowa roots, and his spiritual relationship to the American landscape. N. Scott Mamaday is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the Pulitzer Prize for his novel, House Made of Dawn, a National Medal of Arts, the Academy of American Poets Prize, UNESCO Artist for Peace, the Annis Field Wolf Book Award for Lifetime Achievement, the Ken Burns American Heritage Prize, to name a few, and he holds 21 honorary doctoral degrees. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor this evening to introduce the 2019 the Ambassador Richard C. Holbrook Award for Distinguished Achievement in Literature, my dad, and Scott Mamaday. I don't see any point in following that. <laughs> Perfectly willing to let that stand. Uh, you know, as I, as I sat over dinner and heard the speakers, I revised what I wanted to say several times. And um, I, I joined that long line of, of uh, people who paid tribute to to uh, our hostess, uh, who has become, I think, a legend by virtue of her, her uh, diligence and dedication. Sharon, thank you very much. I want to, of course, express my deep gratitude for being granted the Ambassador Richard C. Holbrook Distinguished Achievement Award. I had the pleasure a while ago of meeting Mrs. Holbrook, an honor. Uh, and of course, I'm grateful as well for the Dayton 
prize. Literature and peace. Literature and peace. I want to talk about that for a moment, that equation. Uh, I believe that literature and peace are inextricably related. Um, it seems to me that the greatest literature moves in the direction of peace. For peace is the ideal achievement of the human condition. And literature is a record of humanity. I have written a poem, especially for this occasion, and I'm not going to read it to you. <laughs> because the print is too small for the reader. So I'm going to call upon my beloved daughter to read it to you, and then I will continue. Jill? You have, I think there's a copy here for you. Facets of discourse. What of disorder, the rending of seams? I dream of a day that has not come, that dissolves not in fire, but in memory. The bright blending of morning and noon, the glitter of leaves dancing, a flicker's wings. Do you imagine a time of peace even now? in the structure of discord and strife? Are we not moored in history? We inherit challenge. We are driven hard to excel as warriors excel in fear and ferment. Green meadows mark the rift of hills where in clear waters flow the hawks sail upon scented winds that bring crystal rain. Ochre cliffs stand against the sun, and a blue stillness holds upon the moon. Damn, that's good. <laughs> the third book that uh, Jill mentioned in her, in her introduction um, is a work in progress. I, it is... Uh, it is a book that I'm calling Dream Drawings, and uh, it, I have about 60 of these. These are all very short, short stories, about a page in length, each one. And I have uh, some 60 now, and I'm shooting for 100. And um, recently I wrote one that uh, I would like to paraphrase for you. Um, it's about a runner. This runner sets out running and he runs for miles and he runs for a long time. He started out at the break of day and it is now nearly noon. And he is nearing the wall of his endurance. And he must get past that wall in order to finish his run. His heart is bursting. He experiences great pain. And he doesn't think he can go on. And then in his peripheral vision, he sees a dog running beside him. It's a beautiful dog. Fast, fluent in its motion. And he is encouraged. He seems, it seems that the dog is urging him on. And there is a great burst of energy in him. And he runs, and he runs, and he finishes the race. And then he looks down for the dog, but it has gone. The dog is gone, and he wonders whether he saw it at all. Well, but it remains for him an emblem of possibility of the farthest reach within him. And it occurs to me that that is what writers do, and it's what literature is about. We must, we must strive to realize the greatest reach within us. That is our humanity. In 2008, I was on a train going from Moscow to Vladivostok, across the whole breadth of Siberia. It was a wonderful train. 
I had a compartment. And in the middle of the night, I was awakened by the stopping of the train. And I looked out my compartment win window and there were soft yellow lights. We had come to a station and I could see people moving in and out of doors. And then a soldier came to my, to my compartment. We had, we, had entered, we had entered Mongolia. And this soldier was a Mongolian soldier. And uh, I gave him the papers of entry that I had prepared in advance. I looked at him, and he was a good-looking, straight young man. And I thought, I had a, I had a strange thought, I, I know this man, and I have been here before, 30,000 years ago. I had returned to a place of origin. I'm having a wonderful time writing this book. I believe that uh, honesty is a greater virtue than modesty, and this book is magnificent. <laughs> I have not met Gloria Steinem, but, but uh, I, I heard a quote from her. She said, at my age, most people are dead. <laughs> she and I are the same age. <laughs> and, uh, so, I, you know, when you begin, to, you begin to attract lifetime achievement awards, you, you, it sort of gives you pause. You know, you know, I am a Native American, as my daughter pointed out. We are Kiowa people. The Kiowas are a Southern Plains tribe. And um, at one time, they owned more horses per capita than any other tribe on the Great Plains. It's a horse person back there. So. Uh, there is a story that I'd like to tell you from Kiowa oral tradition. Uh, there was a man who owned a black hunting horse. It was black, fast, and afraid of nothing. When it was turned in the direction of an enemy or prey, it struck at full speed. The man need have no hand upon the rein. But, you know, that man knew fear. And once, during a charge, he turned that animal from its course. That was a bad thing. The hunting horse died of shame. That story, which is the shortest story in my collection of oral, Kai oral stories called The Way to Rainy Mountain, says more about the horse culture, the centaur culture, as it's called, than any book that I have ever read. It's a wonderful bit of oral tradition, oral literature, isn't it? That's one story. I'm going to tell you another. When I was teaching at Stanford, I lived in San Francisco a part of that time, and one day I was invited to speak to a group of sixth graders at the Hebrew Academy of San Francisco. And I, I had to hesitate because I was not used to speaking to sixth graders. But I accepted. And I uh, went to teach that I was facing these bright-eyed kids sitting in the classroom. And I didn't, at, at first I didn't know what I would say to them. Then, it occurred to me that these, the stories in The Way to Rainy Mountain are wonderful stories that might well appeal to children, young, young people. There is one story about um, a man who is saved by a dog. And there is in, in Kiowa oral tradition a formula indicating a long time in the past, and it goes like this. This happened a long time ago when dogs could talk. 
Well, I thought to myself, what sixth grader can possibly resist a story about a man who was saved by a talking dog, right? And so I launched into this story. The story goes like this. Uh, there was a man who had been thrown away. We're not quite sure what that means, but we assume he was abandoned. He was alone on the prairie, and he expended all of his arrows shooting game, and then he was out of arrows, and he was at the mercy of the elements. Whereupon, a dog comes up to him and says, Oh, you are in a bad way. I would not want to be in your moccasins. <laughs> and the man says, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> and the dog says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know how dogs are. <laughs> wait a minute. I could save you. And the man said, well, if you can save me, please do. And the dog said, wait a minute. Again, you know how dogs are. I have puppies. They are little. They are cold. They are hungry. If you will take care of my puppies, I will save you. So the bargain was struck. The man readily agreed. And the story ends. The dog led the man round and round, and they came to safety. Well, I started to tell this story, these bright sixth graders, listening, looking up at me, and I said, oh, by the way, this happened a long time ago when dogs could talk. And a little girl in the front row looked up at me and she said, those were the days! <laughs> hour grows late, you have been very attentive, and so it remains for me to greet you warmly, to thank you wholeheartedly, and very sincerely to wish you well. Good night. Be still, gather yourselves, a storm rolls away and there comes a clear dawn. My mantra. <laughs>